Uh, boy, I tell you, show business is fun. Yeah. I guess you'll be, you'll be getting that right on the anniversary. I want to, yeah, I want to cut this one out real quickly so the people who missed it will get a chance to miss it again. <laughs> you take a shot. I know, you, you did every it. joke. You do the jokes, no matter. You just no, keep plunging you straight everyone ahead. everyone with hope. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite people is here, and I know you are um, a fan of this gentleman and highly respectful. He's, he's been a, one of our best guests we've ever had on the show. Uh, he's a world-famed astronomer, professor of uh, planetary studies at Cornell. His latest book is called uh, Cosmos, which also happens to be the name of the show, which debuts September 28th, this Sunday, on PBS, and is devoted to the study of the cosmos, which I don't know is... We'll find out the difference between the cosmos and uh, the universe and so forth. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Carl Sagan. First of all, congratulations, because I know how long you have discussed this project here many times on the show, and to see it come to fruition must be uh, quite, quite a thrill for you. It's a pleasure to have done Cosmos uh, with a group of extremely talented yeah. people and to see it fulfill all my expectations and yeah. more. I'm really pleased. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. It's gotten some tremendous, tremendous publicity. Yeah, it has. Uh, the cover of TV Guide this week. I noticed on the Herald Examiner the other day. A uh, complete review of it, which is rather unusual for the show that goes... And there's something I was talking about this afternoon that kind of bugs me, and, and maybe it does you too. Uh, television network keeps saying they want to put on quality shows, shows for the family, upgraded. Now, a show like this comes along, which really is where a family can sit down with their youngsters and explore the universe and all about life, and it ends up on PBS, which is only unfortunate to the extent that it's not going to get the huge audience that commercial television has. Did, did, did you talk to any of the networks at all about something like this? Well, we, we didn't uh, try to sell it to, to the networks. Right. Uh, KCET Los Angeles, the PBS right. station here, came uh, to us with a proposal, and as soon as it was clear that we would have content control, we, right. we said yes. And uh, part of the reason that uh, PBS um, is not a supremely effective uh, competitor with the networks is right. that there aren't PBS stations in a lot of places yeah. and they're also UHF instead of VHF so they're just not uh, you know people can't have access to it yeah. but we're hopeful at least some people have said I would like to think that along the way that the uh, the network the major networks will pick up on it and show these episodes well I hope so too and if you uh, happen to see Fred Silverman you might mention it yeah <laughs> let me let me check with him <laughs> his office right here he Actually, actually moved right down here to keep, keep a tight control on things. Uh, when people talk about the universe and the cosmos, what's the difference? Cosmology and uh, astronomy are They're related. Certain, but certainly related. But cosmos is a Greek word, which means not just the universe, but the aspect of it which permits it to be understood, the ordered and regular aspect of it. You could imagine a universe which was fabulously chaotic, in which there were no regularities, no rules, no laws of nature. Right. But fortunately, we don't live in such a universe. We live in a universe which can be understood, in which the laws of nature here are the same as billions of light years away, uh, which means that uh, all you have to do is study the science here, yeah. and you can know about a whole lot of other places. So far, that, that does hold up, doesn't it, that the, the mathematical and physical laws that are observable here seem to be universal as, as far as can be determined now. Yeah. It's, it's a remarkable fact. Do I mean, you think there's any possibility? Now, of course, we're right back to the chicken and the egg thing again. Possibility that there might be something... Well, how can there be something beyond something? You know, it's the old finite... Depends infinite. what the definition of the universe is. If the universe yeah. is everything that is, then there isn't anything outside the universe. But it is possible to have closed-off regions of space which are separated from others. And in that sense, there might be other universes, and there might even be ways of going to them, although this is a highly speculative point. In Cosmos, we have some fun with this. I uh, slide down into a black hole to uh, find out what happens. You see me disappearing uh, down the black hole. It's an interesting term, isn't it, for something that you can't see. So how do you describe what the black... Since one cannot be seen, I guess you it's there because of the emissions of the... Well, it's two ways. One is it's, it's enormous gravity. A black hole is a place where the gravity is so intense that even light can't get yeah. out, so it's completely dark. But... If it's revolving around some other object that is shining, right. then by the gravitational tugs that the black hole makes on this other star, you can detect its presence. And another thing that happens is that black holes tend to have uh, disks of matter surrounding them, 
uh, in which the friction generates X-rays. And uh, one of the candidate black holes, something called Cygnus X1, both does this gravitational pull yeah. and is a source of X-rays and very likely is an example of the legendary black hole. Yeah, then there was a the theory that once you enter a black hole, you could go into another universe or yeah. to, to another time frame. I suppose that's science fiction so far? Well, there are some people who seriously think that if you uh, were to slip down into a black hole and could survive the trip, which is highly unlikely, uh, that you would emerge some where else in space and some when else in time. Yeah, those are concepts that are hard for the mind to really, to really sort out. And they might even be false, but they're fun to talk yeah. about. We have a, a couple of little pieces of film from, uh, is this from the, one of the upcoming episodes? Yeah. Tell you what we'll do. Let me do the commercial first, then we'll come back and tell us what we're going to see. Terrific. And uh, we'll watch together. Stay where you are. Pillsbury bakes better tasting brownies than my Duncan Hines and its flavor packet than my Betty Crocker with its can of flavoring? Sure, let's see. Pillsbury Deluxe Fudge Brownies. No packets or cans. Pillsbury blends three rich cocos right into the mix. They're better tasting fudge brownies. Pillsbury tastes richer than mine. So chocolatey and moister than mine. Taste Deluxe Fudge Brownies. You'll agree the best word for brownies is Pillsbury. My text got more. Yep. My man got more. Yeah. My George got more. Uh-huh. More close shaves per blade. Super 2 Ultrax gives more close shaves than Track 2. Watch. One push pushes out soap and stubble. Your twin blades start clean, sharp for more close shaves. Ultrax slides on Track 2 razors, clicks on Atra. Get Ultrax for more close shaves. Hey, more close shaves than Track 2. Okay, uh, Carl, why don't you explain what, uh, what, we're, uh, what we should look for in this first clip here. Well, Cosmos is certainly about things in astronomy, but it's about a whole lot of other things, uh, too. A lot of other sciences, but also myth and politics and religion right. and history. Uh, also biology. And uh, the two clips we're going to see have to do, one, with what it is really like were you to dive into a living cell. I prick my finger and make some blood. Then the camera swims into it's the like bloodstream. like Fantastic Voyage, yeah? Except we go deeper than they did into the cell towards the heart of life of the DNA molecule. The other one shows in 40 seconds a compression of the four billion year history of life on Earth. So right. we evolved from the first cell to human beings. I don't know what order you have it in, but... Right, what do we, what do we have first? Well, we'll talk over it here. You can watch the monitor. Watch it here, and then we can... Here's a monitor right up here, Carl. Good. So here is the blood gushing from my finger. This is uh, episode two of uh, Cosmos. Is this like an electron microscope type? No, this is so far uh, optical microscopy. Right. You can see this with, uh, with an ordinary microscope if uh, you were down at that level. And every one of those is a red blood cell carrying uh, oxygen, as uh, the line of my co-writer Annie Gian says, to the remotest freckle. <laughs> um, those are cells in the blood. Those are cells in the blood. And most of them are red blood cells, but we are going to dive into a leukocyte, this one, uh, uh, sorry, a lymphocyte, and we're going to dive in to the inside of the cell, which is quite like many other uh, cells in the body. And uh, all of this information is as precise as we can manage it. You can see a, a bunch of five green blobs that we're approaching. 
Those are kind of uh, factories on which enzymes are manufactured by instructions sent from inside the nucleus of the cell. In a single cell. The nucleus. Yeah, yeah. This is a whole cosmos inside right. a cell. This big blue lump to the right that we're approaching is the outside of the nucleus of the cell. In there is the holy of holies, the place where every activity in the cell and in all of life uh, is directed from. Uh, the nucleus contains the master molecule of life, right. DNA, which we see here. It's been described as an explosion in a spaghetti factory. <laughs> every one of those long strands is uh, a uh, molecule of DNA containing yes. all the hereditary it's information. The double helix. Uh, double helix. Uh, <laughs> Almost, it's almost surrealistic, right? A it cell is. is almost like the universe in a uh, microcosm, is. right? Yeah, it's exactly the right word, a microcosm, a small universe. Yeah. And uh, there are trillions of such cells within us. In fact, there are, uh, there are as many cells in the human body as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And every one of those cells comes, of course, from one cell, a fertilized egg, and every one of them contains the identical genetic information on how to make the next generation. Yeah. You mentioned the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, um, which we can't see because, we're stuck, because we're stuck in the middle of it, like, like in the forest. But there was, I was reading an article in an astronomy magazine where they kind of depicted what it would look like if you could yeah. ever observe it from the outside. We do that in Cosmos. We, yeah. we approach the, the Milky Way from the outside. And our oh, galaxy yeah. is just one of billions of billions of galaxies. That's right. So there are something like a one followed by 22 zeros number of stars in the cosmos. Yeah. It's an extremely big place. Yeah, and the average distance between the stars, you look at night and they look so close together, and the average distance is maybe four or five light years apart, That's right? right. They... A light year being about 10 trillion kilometers. So actually, space is actually mostly empty. It's, the universe is made mostly of nothing. Yeah. I know you hold to the fact, or, or you're one of the people, I think, that would like to believe that there are intelligent beings on other planets. We've discussed this before, but it, it's always intriguing because of what it would do psychologically, probably, to human beings here. I think it would be a character-building experience for us. I mean, think of the arrogance <laughs> of assuming that, that out of 100 billion stars in this uh, Milky Way galaxy, or 400 billion stars, that ours is the only one which has an inhabited planet. It's such a self-centered... It's a rather chauvinistic view. attitude, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah, but then there are other people who think we may well be unique and, and, and put up fairly valid arguments showing what has to happen here is very unlikely that it would happen some other no. places. They put forth those arguments anyway. Yeah, those arguments are, are put forth. Precisely what happened here is impossible to happen somewhere else. But life is, covers many different... Yeah, forms. we look at us, you know... I think we've talked about this some before. Somebody said if you were going to create uh, a, a perfect human, or when I say human, a perfect living thing, you wouldn't have two ears over here. You would have something coming out of the top of your head that would hear sound all around, right, to be completely efficient. Well, there's no question that, that we are the way we are because of a long evolutionary heritage, and, you know, our ancestors walked on four legs. Well, in fact, we'll see that in the, in the next clip, and a no, lot of... Huh? I don't think so. Uh, can we run it quickly? Run it, run it right now, Bob. Let's do it. It's 40 seconds. Okay, let's, let's get going. This is the evolution of life. Four billion years compressed into 40 seconds. Here we go. These are molecules before the origin of the first cell. The first now they're cell. dividing. Yeah. The first communal organism composed of many cells. Here's our ancestor who was stuck on the ocean bottom. Then he evolved gill slits. The ability to swim, something now recognizably a fish, an amphibian which colonized the land hundreds of millions of years ago. A branch led to the dinosaurs, but that's not our branch. Our branch, small, furry, scurrying creatures who took to the trees and then came down, invented language and technology, and became us. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We'll be right back. You won't find them in a Sealy. You won't find them in a Serta. 
You won't find them in a Stearns and Foster, but you will find them in a Beauty Rest by Simmons. Hundreds of these exclusive Beauty Rest coils. They're wrapped individually so they're free to move separately to give every part of your body the kind of firm, comfortable support you won't find anywhere but here. There's just no rest like a Beauty Rest by Simmons. Look who's turning Diet 7 up. I guess you have to give up a lot to fit into your costume, huh, Linda? I don't have to give up anything, Don. Remember, I'm a star. <laughs> Besides, any diet drink can help me fit into my costume. Then why the Diet 7-Up, sweetie? Because it's crisp, it's light, it doesn't have that funny diet taste. Why are you drinking it, Don? Well, I like the taste, too. That's impossible. Why is that? Because you don't have any taste, Donnie, dear. <laughs> You're a beauty, too. <laughs> a dandy. Diet 7-Up. The only thing you give up is calories. Okay, we've got three, three big shows coming up. You'll be first on Sunday at 10 o'clock out here. The, see, there are some people from another planet right there. Uh, yours is 10 o'clock out here. Sunday. Some Sunday day. Steve's yeah. show is uh, Tuesday Steve at 10 o'clock. And we'll be on Monday at 9 o'clock for the anniversary show. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. There's the book. That's the show.